Excessive materialism and militarism. We know full well that racism is still that hound of hell. Is it cool if I look at my notes? Like I like yeah, definitely. Because I was doing, I'm in the middle of like finals season right now. So it's like, let me do some research on like, I knew like yeah. about her, but I didn't know about her. So now I'm good. Yeah, I'm really excited. Yeah. Uh, and you're studying law, right? Yes. Yeah. How have you been today? I'm good. I mean, I worked earlier, so that was cool. Mm -hmm. And um, worked out for a little bit. And we just like kind of walked around Williamsburg. Yeah, where do you where do you live? Uh, we live in South Brooklyn, so it's Bensonhurst. It's kind of like heavily Italian, Jewish, um, Asian, mm -hmm. mostly Chinese, but yeah. Yeah, I haven't really been to Bensonhurst, I don't think. Yeah, it's way in the hell out there. It's South Brooklyn, <laughs> yes. so unless you live there or like you have a reason to be out there, I, it's understandable. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, okay, so are we recording? I can't really tell. Oh, it's recording. <laughs> I was just like, I wasn't sure. <laughs> um, but welcome to Now in Color, the podcast that brings those who have been erased from history back to the forefront. I'm your host, Sandy Chang. And today I'm joined by Renee De Jesus. Perfect. Yes, <laughs> I can pronounce things. <laughs> Renee is a proud Chicana. And I'm, um, I'm not me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and she's originally from Phoenix, Arizona, and has lived in Brooklyn, New York for about nine years. She comes from a large family and she has nine siblings, four of which are quadruplets. Mm -hmm. This is crazy. It's insane. Yeah. That reminds me of ever since I saw us, I've been like <laughs> freaked seen out. It. Oh, <laughs> oh my no. gosh, never mind. I need to watch <laughs> never it. mind. <laughs> I can't spoil it now. Um, she grew up on the south side of Phoenix where she saw very few white people. That is a first. Mm. Um, the area was majority black and Mexican, and she wasn't exposed to white classmates until she moved to a better side of Arizona and enrolled in a heavily white junior high. She recently married her husband, Juan Carlos, who is from the Dominican Republic, and he's lived in Brooklyn since he was seven years old. He's raising... Th She's a rising 3L mm -hmm. at CUNY School of Law. It's very hard to switch from I know, first person. I'm so to, sorry about that. No, don't worry <laughs> about it. Um, she's interned for a nonprofit organization, and she's worked mostly with individuals seeking, seeking asylum relief. It was one of the most meaningful and impactful experiences she's had since enrolling in law school, and it's really so solidified her passion for immigration work. Her goal is to become an immigration attorney, and her mission is to support, uplift, and protect black and brown communities through her work. Welcome. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Sorry, that was like so hard for me to no, read. My fine. brain cannot switch <laughs> from first person to... It's tough. It's um, tough to do. What is the... Third? third? I think it's person? Third. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so tell me a little bit more about growing up in Phoenix, what it was like to grow up in, I guess, the south side of Phoenix. Mm -hmm. I guess there is a difference. I've yes. never been to Phoenix. Um, <laughs> could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, more? sure. I mean, it's like anywhere. There's like, you know, so-called good sides and bad sides. Um, south Phoenix was known for being one of like the maybe more dangerous sides. There was, you know, a lot of gang activity, drug activity, and then it was just a very impoverished side of Phoenix. Um, so growing up, I had three siblings. So there were four of us all together. Um, and, you know, we went to school, did, you know, all the normal things, but you don't realize how abnormal things were until you get to like, let's say that better side of town, because then you realize, mm -hmm. whoa, there's resources, there's other things. So it was an interesting way to grow up. I think it kind of forced me to grow up a lot sooner than maybe I would have. Um, I don't, you know, I obviously everything happens for a reason. I'm happy because it's made me who I am today. Very resourceful, very, you know, independent. Um, I stand up for myself, stand up for others if I can. Um, so it was, it was fine. You know, it's just like how you read in the beginning, there were very few white people. Like I really didn't see any until, or like very few until seventh or eighth grade. Cause it was just all the black and Mexican kids went to that school in that district, you know? Right. Yeah. And when you got to the quote unquote better side mm -hmm. of town, what impact did that have on you as a kid at that time? Or was there any impact or were you just like, oh, this seems better? Yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah. It was very much a culture shock. Um, mm -hmm. 
also there was a feeling of kind of like inferiority. So when you don't learn certain things, like because I remember our schools, there was like 40, sometimes 50 kids in one room. And like you didn't always get your own desk and definitely didn't get a book. Like there was a book in the classroom that you used for that day, maybe. Um, So moving to that side of town, it was like a big culture shock. And it's like, oh, I have my own desk. And like now it's almost competitive now. Like people want to get good grades when grades weren't even like a thought in my head before. Um, And then just like the culture itself, like white culture, if you want to call it that, I guess, is very different from like how I was raised and the traditions that I was raised with and the things that I believed in. So it was very difficult to try to fit in, but also stay true to who I I was. And I think as a child, it's really hard to like navigate that. Like as an adult now, I'm much more confident with that. But as a child, it was tough. What were some things you were saying about white culture, yeah. quote unquote? Um, it's so hard with podcasts. I'm just like, I'm quoting. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was a big shock to you that you felt like I don't understand this or I don't get this. Um, And how did you overcome it if you have? Yeah, one of the things I guess was just like the lack of respect. I felt like there was just a general lack of respect among them themselves. Like there was no like code of conduct or like, I guess it was just kind of understood in our schools that you acted a certain way around your friends, with your teachers and with your family. And once I got exposed to like this these like white classmates and how they spoke to their parents and how they spoke to like the teachers and I just remember being shocked like oh crap they actually like spoke back you know and you're not supposed to do that you're supposed to show respect to your elders and you know know that they're whatever they're putting on you it's for a good reason you know even if you can't explain the reason so that was shocking the competitiveness was shocking it's like oh what score did you get on that test and I'm like what test like I don't even remember taking one (laughs) it just was not on my radar so that was also very like shocking you know that that was a thing we're competing for something I don't know what it's like a common joke I feel like especially in um with immigrant children or children of immigrants that you're always shocked when you go to your white friend's house and they're like shouting at their mom and you're like no you're gonna get killed yes um but it yeah it's like a it's very interesting that we share that as well because I was also very I feel like my parents actually accused me of being super Americanized (laughs) because I would be kind of like I was also the youngest so Mm. I feel like I would be more combative than my brother who is much more respectful and traditional (laughs) (laughs) um sorry I just went on a whole tangent (laughs) um so what led you to studying law Um, I think it's one of those things where I was a little argumentative as a kid. So I I used to hear that a lot, like, oh, you'd make a great lawyer, because that's what people think of when they hear the word lawyer, that you're just good at debating and arguing. So it was kind of always in my head. Um, But I think there came a point where I kind of let that dream go. And I was like, I'm just going to figure out my way in life and just kind of play it by ear. I didn't really have a plan. And then at one point, um, I just really remember thinking like, like I was sitting, I was working at a startup. Um, It was like a school that taught foreign languages to adults, so people that wanted to learn second and third languages. And one of the women I worked with, she was like, what did you like want to do when you were younger? Because we were both talking about how much we like hated the job and like, you know, we just wanted to get out. And I was like, you know what? I always wanted to be a lawyer. And she's like, you know what? Just do it. Like, if that's what you want, do it. And then from that point on, that was like my goal. And that was like in 2013. It took me a while to get to law school. Yeah. And that's so great. I feel like it always starts with a startup, with a bad, toxic startup. The worst. There are so many out there. And each one thinks that they're changing the world. And it's just like, it's so, yeah. That makes it so much. Because I I work for a startup right now, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm I'm working remotely, but... It's all literally the same thing at every startup because I've worked at three or four. It's that is white culture to me. Like, but it's crazy. Yeah, I th- we also share that in common. <laughs> I've also worked for a lot of startups, mm. and each time I'm like, I'd rather be dead. I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like yeah. it would get to that point where I'm just like, I don't understand. Like I just don't understand that lean in men- mentality yeah um which of course Cheryl Sandberg has pushed onto every woman who works for a startup or a tech company yeah. it's just like you gotta lean it and I just like could never do it and yeah. I I don't know if that was like an excuse I was just like it made me feel bad yeah and I just wasn't I guess masculine presenting enough 
to be to thrive in a startup like I'm not very aggressive or combative mm. and I yeah. feel like you have to have that mentality to thrive in startup culture you do and I think it also being women of color I think plays a huge role too Definitely. so there's certain things that we can't get away with that maybe somebody else could um that whole lean in thing it's like you're able to talk about that and do it because you're a white woman and you have like power privilege all of that good stuff um but we face different barriers like first our like ability to even like function is questioned like I've had that happen so many times I've had my intelligence questioned and you know when I first I was at this startup when I said I was going to go to law school and the reactions were so telling it was like oh really you think you could like take the LSAT and do you know all the things that's required and it was just really telling you know that they, that was their first thought is like do you even have what it takes are you even smart enough to do that and that's been such a theme like throughout my entire life that it's just like you kind of expect it yeah and how do you I'm sure that is so stressful is like the lightest word I can think of but it's a huge stressor that microaggression are there ways that you found that you can come up against it or just go beyond it or is it still just something that you're constantly facing um and I'm almost asking for me too because <laughs> I get really overwhelmed when I'm yeah. when I have a lot of microaggressions thrown at me and I always think am I crazy or did I imagine that yep and that's yeah. part of the game that's like phase one like yeah. question yourself and figure out if you're overreacting or if you're just like being too sensitive or maybe you aren't that smart and maybe they're asking it because you know it, there's some truth to it and I think that's like the first hurdle to get over so I've I'm not going to say I've completely surpassed that. There are times where I question myself and I'm like, oh, I don't know if I can do this, but it's okay for me to question that, not for other people. So I've gotten better about it, but like the ways that I've approached it really depend on the person and the situation. So if it's with, let's say like a classmate, I'm much better about asserting myself and saying like, you know, you're not allowed to talk to me like that. And this is why. And, you know, in a work environment, I feel like it's a little bit different because your money is at stake. You know, you don't want to oh lose my gosh, yeah. your paycheck. And so you have to come up with creative ways to like, it sounds petty and it is kind of petty, but like aggress back and like, I'm going to get my jab in. Like when you're having your little spring salad, I'm going to ask you if you seasoned it so that you will feel uncomfortable <laughs> because you made me feel uncomfortable. That's not the most mature way to handle it, but it's kind of like my way of getting through it. Otherwise, I would just ignore it, you know, which also yeah. carries its own weight because you oh take that gosh, home yeah. with you. Yeah, definitely. Um, for a long time when I was working at one of those startups, I definitely took that home with me. And I would be like, I guess I'm going crazy because one thing um, growing up in a very traditional Chinese family, my mom would always be like, well, maybe it's you <laughs> because, oh, you know, with yeah. Chinese culture, it's all about like keeping harmony and like respecting your elders mm -hmm. and you know and she's coming from a background where she's like you know there are no such things as like microaggressions you right, know because right, she right. hasn't I'm sure she's experienced it but in a different way yep. and she'll always be like maybe you're just being like too aggressive or mm -hmm. you're being some type of way so that would also be like oh my god maybe I am going crazy mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's hard I think as an Asian American to see other people thrive in office culture and startup culture and mm. love that hustle and then you're like the one person who's like I don't struggle this yeah. yeah yeah so I don't know how to get through microaggressions either it's a work in progress I feel like at some point I, like anything whatever works for you in the moment and then taking it home I think is like the worst because like you said it becomes a hell like you don't want to go there anymore because you just know what the day is going to hold for you so I just feel like the sooner you get away from it, the better, obviously. But like, if that's not feasible, just, I mean, doing what you can, it's survival, which unfortunately is like the name of the game for most people of color, women of color. It's just survival. Yeah. And when we first were talking on the phone, I remember we talked a lot about law school and that's like a whole other game of survival. <laughs> <Girl>. <laughs> um, it's bad. If you want to, we can discuss it or if you don't, yeah, we don't, I don't have I to. Mean, yeah. I'm pretty sure people will know what I'm talking about because law school is heavily white. Like even in a place like New York, you would think there'd be more diversity. And I'm sure there's more here than probably in other places. But just picture a classroom full of white dudes that cannot wait to give their opinion on something. It's like my fucking nightmare. And I'm sorry. No, it's you can nightmare. curse. I curse all the time okay. on this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it's like it's a constant struggle of like, am I going to waste my energy and like argue with this person because I know they're wrong? 
Or am I just going to let it go, but then at the expense of myself and maybe others in the room, you know, because there's plenty of times where it's like people show their like anti-blackness and I'm just like, it shouldn't be on any black person in that classroom to say, whoa, that's messed up. Like, you can't say that. And, you know, obviously, if I have the energy and the ability to do so, I, I will speak up if I can. But it's just like you're constantly on this like road of being aggressed against and you have to choose when and where to use that energy. Yeah, yeah, that is very difficult, especially if it's like a daily thing mm-hmm. and being in a classroom. Do you find that professors are the same way or are they on your side? And looks like no, that no. answer is no with how you reacted as soon as I said that. I know. It's, a, it's an issue in academia too. Like I just feel like a lot of the professors that are, they get their asses kissed are like the white, male or white female um, professors and again those voices have been heard like I'm tired of learning from white people I want to learn from black and brown people like I have one I've only had one black female professor this entire time or actually two one of them worked there part-time and the other one she's tenured but you know it's difficult because you don't get to hear from different perspectives and the way that a black or brown person would teach a subject is completely different from the way that a white professor would so I feel like they kind of, a lot of the white professors there and in other sc- undergrad everywhere perpetuate those same harmful ideas and stereotypes that I'm trying to get away from. Like I came to this school specifically because I believe in social justice and I want to break those barriers and I want to find out how to like gather, unite, protect and like, you know, thrive. But we're not necessarily being given those tools because we're being taught the law in the same way that it would be taught anywhere else. Right. You know, what are some ways that I mean, academia is just like a long, huge institution Mm -hmm. that, so this seems like, what are some ways we can combat that? It (laughs) seems like it's a very fruitless question. Yeah. Um, But, you know, are there communities for students of color, especially who study law or social justice that are thriving right now that you know about for any listeners who are interested in pursuing law or want to get into academia? Yeah, I think it's the same as any any other place. You find your group, you find your, your people, you find the ones that believe in the same things that you believe in. Um, and my advice for law schools would be to hire more people of color and, you know, put them on tenure track. Don't just have them there as like adjunct or like temporary. And, you know, the whole syllabus, like, if you're doing the same syllabus that you did back in like the 90s, there's a problem because that's, that's still happening. Like, I feel like when I look at when we read all these cases, like in first year, every law student reads um, constitutional law, like you learn about con law and you read like Brown versus Board of Ed and you, you read all of these like very important cases. But it's still from like the perspective of the colonizer, like they're talking about how these laws were in place, but we're not stopping to take a moment to say like, wait, why was that law that way? And why was that acceptable at one point? And examining it from that, that lens, you know, it's like, I guess it's just hiring more people of color, because if you have more people of color in the room, they would bring up that question and say, like, why is this this way? Like, we need to teach this completely differently. And there's a strategic way that we can still impart the important information that these people need to pass the bar, but they can also still get that, you know, that meaningful, like learning Yeah. And I do believe, even if it's idealistic, I do believe it all starts with education Mm -hmm. and education as should be decolonized. Agreed. Yeah. um, This just reminded me of the Ancestry.com commercial that happened. (laughs) And a lot of the comments were just like, did you not hire any person of color to just look at this for like a second? Um, And for people who don't know what I'm talking about... I just find it really hilarious at this point. It is um, the commercial is about a, a a slave enslaved woman who's running away with a white man, I mm-hmm. guess, to the north, and it's very romanticized and it's like Game of Thrones feeling, and it's just about like find your ancestors. <laughs> and I was like, that's, that's wild. Horrible. That is wild. Um, But yeah, in that same vein of education and academia, if you have people of color in the room, Mm -hmm. you can learn so much more. Yeah. And you learn it from their perspective because all of the like I was just talking about this with um, in the morning about the Constitution. A lot of people like to say I'm in support of it. It's an important document. You know, it's historical. 
And we never actually have the conversation about who wrote this. It was a bunch of older white men that were landowners. So the laws that, that they created were not for all of us. It was for them. So the fact that we're still relying on this really old and like racist document to guide us now is, is just, I don't know how to talk to those type of people anymore. Because if you respect it, then I, there's just something missing there. Right, exactly. Yeah. And I think this is a great segue for your topic that you brought in today. <laughs> Would you like to introduce it? Yes. Okay. So this topic, which I researched, um, is about a woman named Sylvia Mendez. Um, and so she was born in Santa Ana, California. And she, her father was Mexican and her mother was Puerto Rican. And essentially, this is a case that doesn't, I mean, we didn't learn it in my law school. I don't think it's not widely taught. It's not like Brown v. Board of Ed because Mm -hmm. that case desegregated across the entire country, whereas this one was for California only. Um, So basically the children, Mexican children went to one school, white children went to another. And so when her father found out that she wasn't allowed to enroll in the white school, you know, he got upset and organized with, I think, like three or four other fathers, parents of children to basically say this is violating their their equal protection, you know, their rights to education and that, you know, the school shouldn't be segregated because it it's it was before Brown v. Board of Ed. So but separate but equal was like the theme. What was uh, what's the eight, uh, not the age range, the year here? This was in 1940. I want to say 46. Mm-hmm. It was and which is pretty interesting because when I was doing research about her, there's actually a book about her and another woman um, that grew up. So that's obviously around the time that the Pearl Harbor attack happened. So she, her family was really close to this Japanese family and she was kind of, she was raised side by side with this girl and they were being sent away to an internment camp. So the father ended up renting their farm to like, you know, build crops and I mean, grow crops and all that stuff. So it was a happy time, you know, there, there was segregation all over the place. There were Japanese people being sent to internment camps. So it was, it was a very tumultuous time. So it's, it was almost shocking to me to know that this family and these families took on this fight at a time when like, if you weren't white, you were being looked at like real crazy. Yeah, 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 exactly. I didn't know. I, I've never heard of this case before. Yeah. Um, And how did you find this case? And like, what, what brought you to this Sylvia was her name? Sylvia. Sylvia Mendez. Um, I was actually reading about it. It was a footnote or like it was one of the footnotes in the Brown v. Board of Education case. And I was like, oh, that's cool. It's a California case. Let me look it up. And um, once I read about it, I was like, wow, we never talk about this because, you know, obviously Brown is an important case and it desegregated schools or it's, you know, everything should have been desegregated at that point. Um, But this is important because a lot of the terminology and language that was used in like the amicus briefs and like the support for this court case was later used in Brown. Mm-hmm. Thurgood Marshall authored something for this case and he later went on to you know be on the Supreme Court and he also, um, so it's all kind of like interconnected. So it, it was troubling to me that like we didn't even take a moment to kind of think about this because a lot of stuff in law doesn't happen. It's not like one single case does it. It's always like a, uh, like a layer of cases that kind of set you up for the big one, you right. know? And I feel like it was very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like intentional. It's intentional that it was a footnote. Yeah, intentional yeah. for that. And, and just intentional that they use this strategy here. Because this kind of goes to like what we spoke about earlier with like the colorism issue. Mm-hmm. And the fact that, you know, there's a lot of anti-blackness, a lot of racism in this country. And I feel like I don't have any, like, I didn't read anything that said this This is my personal feeling about it. Trying this with brown kids was probably the easy step to do. You know, don't go straight for the black kids because that might be too risky. Let's try this out with some brown kids because that happens. You know, the closer you are to whiteness, I feel like the easier it is for you to, like, win these battles. So that's why I feel like it was kind of intentional. I don't have any way of proving that. But, you know, I think it's important that we know about the reasoning and like why this was done this way and how it led to this other, you know, enormous landmark case. Right. And I don't think it has to always be said in a textbook or like explicitly said anywhere, but you can use, I think what's important is to critically think about why some cases are heard and some are not, Mm -hmm. like you were saying. Um, um, in a similar way of like why some things in history are important and some are not. Um, and it's very um, strange, not strange. It's very 
something <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that most of our history is about Western history and like European history. Um, and that's all I've learned. Mm-hmm. Um, even with the most recent, you know, burning of Notre Dame. Yes. Even then I was just like, oh yeah, I am sad about it. But then when I was thinking more about it, I was just like, there were so many other churches that are burned all the time. Yep. And why are we just mourning this one that has billions of dollars behind it already from the Pope or whoever in the Catholic Church. <laughs> Everybody's putting up their money for that. Right, exactly. Um, but what about places like Flint? And what about places like Puerto Rico? Yep. And it's just, even then I had to take a step back and be like, oh, like I've also been influenced in a very European lens. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like there were, I read somewhere that there were like black churches that had burned, I think either the days before that happened or maybe at the same time. And that got no coverage, you know, unless you were like from that state or from that area. Black churches here in the United States. So I just, it's like a valuing of European artifacts more so than like our own. And also the Catholic Church, you know, that's a a whole other issue of colonization, too, which I know that that's kind of like a contentious issue because, you know, I was raised Catholic. You know, a lot of Mexicans were, a lot of Hispanic people were, but that is also a result of colonization, you know, from Spain and, you know, wherever else. So I think they're like sensitive subjects to talk about, you know, so like the feelings that I, I have the same feelings about the Notre Dame thing, it's just... I understand why people would be upset, but I feel like that we should be able to like change the pipes in Flint or send money to Puerto Rico. You're completely right. We should be able to do that. But try explaining that to somebody that's like an old school, you know, like my grandmother or somebody that like loved that church. Yeah, it's hard. It is very hard. And um, I also loved Paris when I visited. (laughs) I was like, it's beautiful here. They have good bread. (laughs) It's just like you forget about all the history. Um, Yeah. And going back to this topic, um, what was the outcome of the case? So the final outcome, the the court ruled in favor of Mendez, of Sylvia Mendez. Um, And one of the arguments that the Orange County School District brought up was that, oh, these kids don't speak English. You know, this is the reason this is one of the reasons why we won't integrate them, because we'll be holding our own back because we'll be struggling to you know, teach these kids the language and these kids, you know, like basically mixing the education levels. And a funny thing that I read in the in one of the court opinions is they had some of the children of those parents go up and testify, spoke English, had no problem speaking the language. So that's not it. Um, And from what I read on different sources, the story was that um, Sylvia went with her aunt to enroll and her aunt was she didn't have a Hispanic surname and her children were very light skinned. They passed for white. So when she went to enroll her kids and Sylvia, who was her niece, and her her nephews, who were brown skinned kids, they allowed her kids to enroll, the the white passing ones, but not Sylvia and her brothers. And the reasoning was they have Hispanic surnames and they're brown. So they need to go to the Mexican school, which so your argument that you brought forth in court was a lie because you just didn't want to mix brown and white kids, you know, just leave it at yeah. that. So the outcome was they ruled in favor of Mendez and, you know, they had to desegregate the schools which isn't a whole other topic because we know how that works it's it's not easy you know I was reading about how she went to that school ultimately and you know people called her names and like bullied her and you know did all kinds of like you know messed up things to her and as a child she was like nine or ten years old I think when this happened you can't really understand it you're like in a better nicer school and they have books and they have like you know all kinds of resources but you're still looked down upon. So it's like, it was a better situation. And um, part of what she said was that I felt like I had to, I had to be successful in that school because my father fought so hard for me to get there. Right. But it's hard, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, And what happened to her after, like, what did she do after school or what is the rest of her life? Yeah. So she eventually became a registered nurse. And I think she did that for like 30 or 35 years um, and then retired. And now she's just like an activist. She just goes around giving speeches at schools. And like she got the um, the Medal of Freedom from Obama back in 2011. Yeah. They like recognized like what her family's contributions were. And then I think there's like two or three schools in California named after her, her or her family's name. That's amazing. Yeah. So she's still she's thriving. Still she's still making history yes. out there. That's great. Yes. 
Uh, I love that. That is so wonderful to hear. And like, there's a positive outcome in the end. Um, and you were saying earlier how uh, for something to be desegregated, it is a tough situation. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you feel now with, I don't, I feel like schools are definitely desegregated, but there still seems to be the similar issues that come up. Yeah. Um, one thing that I keep thinking about is, I think it was recently Park Slope or Dumbo, one of those high-end <laughs> Brooklyn places <laughs> <laughs> where there was like some zoning issue and a lot of parents were angry mm-hmm. about their kids being with dumb kids. Yeah. And who were the dumb kids, you know? who were they exactly. accusing of being dumb kids so is our schools really desegregated or nah i mean i think there are some that are are desegregated um at least obviously by law it's not allowed anymore but there's the whole like where you live matters how they do the zoning matters it impacts what district you can go in that was an issue for us too you know when we went to school when we were younger it was you know black and brown kids because of where we happen to live and even trying to like, because there are parents and family out there that, oh, you can use this address and then that way your kid will go there. But that's like a crime in most states and most cities. So, which is like wild. <laughs> yeah, like I'm like, sure my mom tried that yeah. a couple times because we moved around a lot at different schools. Um, and it wasn't until we left that zip code and went to the quote unquote better side of, of uh, Phoenix that we finally got access to these better schools because now our zip code, because now by law, you can't deny me. I'm in the zip code, so I have to be here. So I think it does play a part, a huge part. Even in New York City, as diverse as we are, there's huge segregation. There's a lot of schools where it's mainly black and brown kids and there's like the white schools and it's, I don't think it's changed. The only thing that changed is the law, but that doesn't matter if the practical effect is still the same. Right. How do people look into... If you've lied about your zip code, right? I'm like so. Like I you feel have like time. I know. I know people have done it. I feel like my family probably did it. I'm just like, yeah. How I mean, do people know when that whole college scandal stuff was happening. I which don't know was why. Like, it's so funny. To it's me. so yeah. I was like, I had to laugh because it's yeah. just wild to me. But there was a story running concurrently about uh, a black mother that wrote her, a different address for her kid and got arrested for it. So it's like, you know, they were kind of comparing the two, like, so this woman can't just say she lives here for the sake of getting her child better education, but somehow it's like, okay, for this, like, really wealthy, privileged, powerful, famous person to, like, get access for their kids to this elite school. You know, the two aren't even the same, but it's just how how heavy handed they are with certain types of people as opposed to the the wealthy, the privileged. Right. Yeah, I. I feel like I haven't even heard of that case where the black yeah. woman was arrested for. Yeah. And was she, do you know if she went to prison for that? I don't know. I, uh, it was very, very recent. So I'm not sure oh, if wow. she's even like on to court for it. I just, I just know that she got arrested for it. Wow. And it's like, you would think that would be all over the place. It's like the woman that voted and she didn't realize she couldn't because she had, she had served time and she had been convicted and there's like, you can't vote if you've been convicted of a crime and she didn't realize and she got sentenced back to, to prison for that. It's like those type of things like you that should make national news and it doesn't. You yeah. Know. And those are important things to know about because I did not know that Very you could important. be arrested if you were once convicted and you voted. I yeah. literally I just found this out <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. And it's like she's just trying to like. There's no intentionality there. I feel like that's something that's very important, too. First of all, voting shouldn't be a crime. Everybody right. should be allowed to vote. Whether you've been convicted of a crime or not, you should have the right. You served your time. You so-called paid your debt because I don't believe in prisons, but yeah, that's the logic, right? So why are you still punishing this person by saying you can't vote? You don't right. have a voice, basically. Yeah. Yeah, I did not know that. Wow. Learning all the time on this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> yeah. Um, Is there anything that you want listeners to learn from this particular story that you brought in or from anything in your personal history that you want just someone to take away from this? If I could think, well, one thing that you said um, a couple minutes ago about education, it is definitely key. And I think the sooner that we educate ourselves about the true history, the better, because I think half of our time, or at least mine, was spent learning these like colonized notions and like learning about these famous white people and what they did and how great they were 
when if I think back on it, I would have loved to have someone say, no, read this book, read this book about, you know, this famous black person or brown person. And there's like a real connection there. And I think it opens your eyes up a lot sooner and you can have a bigger impact because once I realized how unjust and how, you know, racist this country is, I feel like it kind of propelled me to do something greater and to like recognize my own privileges and how I could use that to help other people or when to step back and let other people have a voice. Um, So the sooner you educate yourself, whether you do it yourself or you go on YouTube, read books, anything, just seek out that knowledge and don't ever just take it straight from one person. Right. You know? Yeah. Don't just take it straight from this podcast. No. Either. Yes. Go if I said anything wrong, resources. I'm so sorry. It's okay. I say wrong things <laughs> all the time on this podcast. Yeah. Um, was there ever a moment for you? Like, was there like a light bulb moment of like, oh my gosh, like most of what I'm learn, what I'm learning is from a colonized point of view or, you know, I, I'm like whitewash quote unquote or something like that was there ever that moment or did you always just know that no I did not always know it it was in college I was at Arizona State University and I enrolled in a class called Chicano Studies because I was like hey this is literally me I should know more about me let me figure out what this is about taught by a white instructor which should have been like my first clue but again I wasn't coming in with that awareness and the first class we talked about how like on the census or like on forms that you fill out the race, like white, black, Asian, like how how that's broken down. And they talked about how if you're, let's say, Mexican-American, you don't really see, because back in that day, there was no box for that. You don't Mm -hmm. really see yourself. You're like, well, what do I check? And I was like, well, I'm not, I'm definitely not black, but, and I am white passing to some people, but I was like, I'm not white. Like, I know I'm not white. I have culture and like, I, you know, I have a lot of differences So once I took that class and I ended up dropping that class because (laughs) the professor was very problematic and kind of said things through his white lens and it was kind of like the wheels were turning and I was like, wait, that can't be right. Like, why am I learning this from a white dude? Like, this doesn't make sense. And I actually ended up withdrawing from that class and like dropping out of college for like a year or two. Wow. Yeah, not solely for that reason, but like that definitely like clicked in my head. And I think that's when I started realizing there's more out there and there's more knowledge out there and it's not just from this one academic source. Right, right. Yeah. I can't believe they hired a white guy to teach that, <laughs> that class. Happens so often. Wow. Yeah. I did not realize that. I feel like they do that a lot. Like even in my law school, I feel like there's classes that I'm shocked that white people are teaching it. Like my, I have a class called Race and Law. That's the professor that I have with the, uh, a black woman. So I was like, great, this is wonderful. But there's definitely been classes where I'm like, whoa, you shouldn't be teaching this because you don't have the skills to teach this to me. Right. You know, yeah, so. I had this one class, um, the only like law <laughs> equivalent class was psychology and law. Mm. Um, and it was taught by a very, well, he named a, a theory after himself. So I think Lord. you can know where that's coming from. <laughs> it's actually very famous. So I probably won't say it okay. out loud, no but I'll tell you off there. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. He was also like very like into himself. I would always draw- talk about how he went to Princeton and it's just like, all right, calm down. Please stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that was the only time I took like something like a law class. And I was like, oh, I don't think this is for me. No. I'm not combative enough. <laughs> <laughs> or even just wanting to deal with the bullshit. Like, yeah, yeah I'm good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and what are some next steps for you after law school? I mean, how many more years do you have left in law school? I'm about to hit my last year. So I'm almost wow. done. I'm going to be studying for the bar next summer, which is wow. like, wild to me because it took me a while to get here um I am going to be interning actually in Phoenix um and it's not for asylum it's for unaccompanied children that have been separated from their parents either at the border or you know just not with their parents for whatever reason and they're going through removal proceedings so I'm going to be doing that that'll be very interesting I've not yet worked with children I've only worked with adults in immigration so that'll be fun um and then after that I just want to do the work you know I just want to get through it and do the work yeah. Oh, I'm so excited that there are people like you who are out there fighting for social justice Thank and you. I appreciate good lawyers that. out there because I've met many bad lawyers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Who I don't know what they're talking about. I'm just like, I could have Googled this. <laughs> Literally. And that's another really great, important thing 
is that the law always comes very like complicated and in terms that are like outdated or in Latin, like like nobody right. speaks that. Stop. So one of my goals that I always try to keep in mind is how to make that information more readily accessible. So how to make it understandable for people so that they don't even need me at one point, like only for like certain official capacity things, but simply understanding the law, it shouldn't take a lawyer. Yeah. It should be like easy enough. Yeah. It's... It is so complicated. There it are is. so many things. And I feel like, I mean, I've only gone through a lawyer for my for my apartment. And even <laughs> then, I'm just like, yeah. you're so unhelpful. I could have Googled <laughs> all of this. Yep. Yep. Um, because I think at the end of the day, they're just, at least the lawyers I've dealt with, they're just like, I just want a paycheck. And I'm like, Literally. I get it. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you're going to focus mostly on immigration and asylum yeah. work. Yeah, that's, that's so where great. I'm headed. Yeah. Um, that's so great. Um, so as we're wrapping up, is there anything that, um, that we're missing on this story that you really need to tell or anything personal coming up for you as in, you know, any events that you want to plug or any, <laughs> anything? <laughs> well, I'm not doing anything. I'm just like always studying or working. So I don't have any events, but um, just thank you for having me and yeah. allowing me to like talk about things. And it's been a, a great experience. I felt really comfortable. So thank you. Yay. I'm so glad. Yeah. Um, and where can people follow you if you want people to follow you on social media? I mean, my page is private, but <laughs> I like filter through people sometimes if I know them. So it's Marnay, I-T-S-M-A-R-N-A-Y. So I will click on your profile. If you're private, I'm going to decline. <laughs> and if you're open and you're not like a crazy white dude, then I'll probably add you. <laughs> Yeah, I was actually thinking at one point, I was like, should I make my thing private? I just don't love I know. how public, I also don't love how public this podcast is making me. I'm just yeah. like, I just wanted to be <laughs> in the background, in the background, no one talked to me. No, <laughs> but this is a good thing. Like this show needs to be heard by everybody, literally everybody. Yeah, it's been such a great learning experience for me too. Um, like I was saying, even with like Notre Dame and I'm just like, oh, that's another way to check myself and yeah. be like, what are my values and what do I value in art and everything? Because I also studied a lot of art history, but Ooh. a lot of it was European art. Yeah. And it's mm -hmm. just like, oh, that's right. Like, I never even looked into any other country. It was just like yeah. Paris and wherever else, Germany. Yeah, yeah. just like where <laughs> big artists come from, Italy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what's given to you. So it's not through any fault of your own. But again, it's like you have to seek it out. Right. It's not going to be given to you. Yeah. And it takes effort to mm -hmm. seek it out. Yeah, it well, does. thank you so much yeah. for joining me. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. Um, before we end, mm -hmm. I do have to plug a sponsor. Yes. And this will all be edited. All right. But <laughs> give me a moment to no pull worries. it up. I don't know if you heard it. It's As long always... as it's not flat tummy tea or something like that, then I'm <laughs> No, it's actually an underwear company. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's um, awesome. Renee, do you think about the underwear? that you wear and how it makes you feel and your overall health because of it. Yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, with Dylan underwear, it's made, It's a panty made to empower women. Dylan is completely seamless and comfortable and is made to have you feel confident and sexy all day long. It's made locally in New York by women for women and new styles are have already come out actually. And you can sign up for the newsletter at dylanunderwear.com and follow them on Instagram at dylan underscore underwear for live updates. And you guys can get 10% off with the promo code now in color. Nice. So check it out. Um, it's a great company. It's a startup, but with a wonderful woman behind it, which is an American woman. Um, yeah, and she's committed to educating women about their health, especially um, vaginal health, because mm. I had no idea that when you wear underwear, it definitely affects your health. Oh, yeah. I, like, didn't think about it. <laughs> just, like, sticking things up there like tampons <laughs> all the time. I'm just like, great. I don't yeah. know. But yeah. tampons are also filled with different chemicals that we don't talk about. So Definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Great plug. 